Welcome to the Kara's Cures Digital Show, where we explore the cutting edge of wellness. I'm Kara Sundlin. This episode is sponsored by the Center for Advanced Reproductive Services. So, how do women beat the belly fat blues in our midlife? I am joined by Dr. Jennifer Stagg, who is a naturopathic doctor and owner of the Whole Health Center in Avon. And she actually has a protocol to beat belly fat. Welcome, doctor. Hi, thank you. Yeah, let's first talk about why. We're not imagining this, like it's just you gain more belly fat around that perimenopause time, which could be in your 40s, 10 years before menopause. Yeah, for sure. So your hormone levels are fluctuating long before you stop having periods. So you're seeing highs and lows. Um, but those declining levels of estrogen definitely have an effect on belly fat. It causes us to basically redistribute our fat. So like normally in those reproductive uh, years, your um, fat is carried on your hips. And then as you go through perimenopause and menopause, it starts to go on your belly. Um, which is not what anybody wants, obviously. Right. So uh, it's a hormonal issue. I guess with less estrogen, it starts to cause more belly fat. Yeah, so definitely the declining estrogen levels uh, causes you to redistribute your fat, but it also causes you to um, have a reduction in your metabolism. You can also have other issues where you're tired, you know, your mood is off, so you're less likely to make good health choices. But there's also really, you know, legit me metabolic issues that are happening during per perimenopause as well, where lower levels of estrogen will impact your um, ability to process like carbohydrate and starch. It can affect your glucose levels. And then, of course, there are other hormonal issues that could pop up, that, which is why, like, seeing a health provider to have all this sort of testing done to check things like your adrenal hormones and thyroid, all of that is really important. Yeah, and just to be clear, it's not always done at your regular physical. I know we all give blood work, but unless you're going to a naturopathic doctor like yourself or a functional medical doctor, often they don't do a lot of hormone testing or stress testing for cortisol. Yeah, that's for sure. I mean, and it's usually just done really targeted, I would say. I would say like hormones could be more likely done at your gynecologist, but just a general annual screening doesn't really include hormone testing. Um, so you really, you know, you need to advocate for yourself and try to get some hormone testing done or see another type of provider who would, you know, routinely run these tests. Yeah. Yeah. And I know that's something you really do in your practice and, and, and the blood testing, you go to Quest, like a regular lab, it's covered. It's just you being a specialist. Um, you've got a lot of women who come to you and are concerned about this weight gain. They think I'm doing all the same things. And that's part of the problem, right? We can't even eat the same way. Um, we, we should be taking in less calories. Yeah, for sure. So as I mentioned, when your estrogen levels decline, even for men also, as we get as everyone gets older, um, your requirements for calories definitely go down. So you do need to eat less. This is what I call the bitter truth <laughs> of aging, yeah. is that you just don't need to eat as much. And then, of course, the composition of your diet matters so much then as well. So we really just don't do as well with carbs as we grow older? Yeah, for the most part, especially women with um, estrogen, it can really affect how we process carbohydrates. So it's not like, you know, I don't advocate a no carb diet in any way. It's just choosing the right types of carbohydrate in the right amounts is really, really important as you get older. If you're dealing with belly fat, you've got to be dealing with, you know, changes in your diet related to carbohydrate. So give us some simple places to start if we're noticing that I, you don't like what's happening. Women will call it the muffin top or even men are saying their pants aren't fitting. Where do we start with diet at least? Yeah, so with diet, I would say the first thing I have patients do is to start tracking their calories. So to use an app like MyFitnessPal, something where you're actually logging in what you're eating and getting a good read on how many calories you're eating a day. And that alone can be really enlightening for people where they realize, oh my God, this is whatever they've had is not worth it. And so they'll definitely reduce the amount they're um, having. But this also allows us to really, you know, target the amount of carbs and fat and protein in the diet and try to change those ratios, which will definitely help with your metabolism and, and um, you know, that belly fat. 
So I, because of folks like you and our trainer, Joe Carabasi, I did download Joe, uh, the MyFitnessPal. It's a free app, and I started logging. Now, the thing is, it, it, it can help you a little bit, but a lot of us, when we're reading labels, if you're reading labels and we've gotten it, it'll say based on a 2,000-calorie diet, right? I mean, so most of us, I'm a 5'2 female. I guess I should... I really shouldn't be eating anywhere near 2,000 calories a day if I want to not have extra belly fat. Like, I know it's personal, but what would you say someone like a, a, a smaller woman, or you know, what's the range? Yeah, so a smaller woman, exactly. 2,000 is way too much, unless you're doing like ridiculous amounts of exercise, like, you know, training for the Olympics, you know, and then you could eat even more than that. But I would say more along the lines of like, if you really want to burn belly fat, you're going to need to probably be down in the 1300 calorie range. Um, and that's something that, you know, you can check over time. We do body composition testing at our office and it tells us the metabolic rate. And then we can, you know, gauge over time, are we seeing actual changes in like fat comp, like fat composition, not just weight on the scale. Can we see changes where you're losing fat and maintaining muscle or even building it? Okay, so to maintain the muscle, do we need more protein? Yeah, but not, again, like not ridiculous amounts of protein either, but like as we age, another thing that happens is our digestion, our digestive function, and even our microbiome, there are changes going on there, and so you can have problems with breaking foods down, absorbing foods, so you tend to need more protein with age. Um, but as I said, you know, you don't need to be on like a 50% protein diet, more on the order of like 30 to 35% of your um, calories coming from protein. Okay. So one of the things, if you are going to download a free app, it's going to, you know, maybe ask you the kind of macros you want, like how many carbs, how many proteins, how many fats. So uh, ideally when you deal with uh, middle-aged women or, or, or men, like what should the macros be? Are they the same for women and men? Yeah. I mean, generally we use close to the same for men and women. And I mostly recommend more of a modified Mediterranean diet, which by definition is going to be more on the order of about 35% fat and then um, protein, probably about 30 and then carbs, you know, 35 to 40%. Okay. So that, that sort of, region, you know, we change it based on how people are doing, but that's a good kind of like gauge for starting place for most people. Which supplements, if any, should you take to help with belly fat and to help with metabolism? Yeah, so if we have, you know, if you've had some testing done and there are issues with glucose metabolism, there are really targeted supplements that can help improve that and improve insulin sensitivity, which is a common thing that I would see. And so in that case, sometimes we're using supplements like berberine as an excellent supplement for improved glucose control. And it's a pretty common issue, but obviously you would want to have that sort of testing done and, you know, you want to make sure you're checking with your doctor to make sure supplements like that are good. But in general, some of the basic things that we think about just for improved fat metabolism are things like um, green tea extract or drinking green tea as an excellent has been shown to reduce belly fat, um, B vitamins, also getting a B12 test. A lot of people get low in B12, that can affect your metabolism. And then a really good um, multivitamin and phytonutrient extract. So a lot of times we'll use vitamin, like a multivitamin that has the phytonutrient extract built in. And phytonutrients are those, um, you know, little chemicals in food, those superfoods that you hear about, resveratrol, things like that. You can also get that in powdered form, and that really does have an effect on your metabolism as well. Right. I know something, because I've had the fortune to go to your office, and you sell something, it's uh, it's your own brand, but it's it's just basically like special greens. They even they come right. in coffee flavor, and you mix them with water, and for those of us who aren't eating enough greens, which I'm sure it's most of us, having a drink like that in the morning can just kind of assure that, all right, I just got like basically five salads in this scoop of something that I'm going to put in my smoothie or my drink. Yeah, absolutely. And that makes a big difference for your metabolism. There's a lot of biochemistry going on there that relates to glucose metabolism and fat burning. And those, you know, pigments found in food are probably more important than a multivitamin kind of multi-mineral supplement. You know, you want to make sure you're getting those basics, but you know, the greens types of powders um, are really, really important. 
So I know you've got some at your office and people can visit you in Avon, Connecticut or go on your website, um, Whole Health. But I, I know another company, Green Vibrance, it's made here in Connecticut. You might find that at Whole Foods. Um, there are, are there any other, if people want to go out and buy one after listening to this, uh, anything you recommend that they can kind of start with? Yeah, there are a lot of really good quality supplements. You just want to make sure when you're looking at those that the that it's organic, ideally 100% organic or close to it. Um, just because you don't want those, you know, chemicals in your um, product. That's really important. And also when it's organic, it's going to have um, kind of like a little bit different composition of the bitter compounds that are in there. There's a lot of chemistry behind that, but basically look for organic when you're looking for your green supplement. Yeah. And bitters, uh, you wrote a book called The Bitter Truth, and it's uh, w w that was a different segment, so people can go back and listen to that on the podcast or on WFSB Plus if you're streaming and watching. But basically having those bitter greens like kale, uh, arugula, even having that before we eat something that might be a little sugary um, can change our digestion. Like even just the order of what we're doing something can put us in that more I guess alkaline state, so we're metabolizing better? Yeah, absolutely, it improves your metabolism and then it also can even cut some of those sweet cravings that mm -hmm. you can develop, right? So also as you get older, there's a whole stress side of things as well that can really kind of um, stimulate that taste for sweet. And some people just genetically also have that sweet tooth and you can actually do a genetic test for that. But more bitters in your diet, having these bitter um, supplements, the bitter powders can reduce your taste for sweet, which obviously is gonna help you lose belly fat if you're not eating as many calories from sweets. Yeah, I still, I definitely have chocolate cravings, but as far as I know, as long as you're having that good dark chocolate, that's okay, right? Yeah. <laughs> maybe not totally maybe not a pound of it, like but low. some of it. <laughs> right. Yeah. You all, all in moderation, but dark chocolate is actually a, one of what we would consider a bitter also. So it's mm. actually good for you, just low sugar you want to find. And also look for chocolate that's over 70% um, cocoa. Uh, powder in there. I'll give a little Kara's Kara's tip to our watchers and listeners. There's a great local place called Divine Treasures. It is more than 70%. I know I've interviewed her. Her mother is diabetic and her mother can even eat her regular chocolate even though she has a diabetic line, but there's nothing bad in it. But uh, looking for that 70% above and also um, I like to have it if people get upset with those super dark, but if you have it with your green tea, it melts nicely. <laughs> Yeah, like that, like the temperature of chocolate makes a difference for how it tastes in your mouth, for sure. So what about exercise? Because there's so many different things like, oh, don't do so much cardio, do more weight training, do HIIT training, how much do we really need? Um, can we just walk? Uh, what's your, what do you want to say for exercise uh, to beat that belly fat in the middle age? Yeah, so it would, first of all, it depends on how much you're already doing. So some women I see are over-exercising and it's not exercise at that point. And too much exercise can all, you know, be perceived as a stress on the body. And then you could actually have elevated levels of cortisol, which can cause like more belly fat. So sometimes we're talking to women about scaling it back a little bit. But I had a patient during the pandemic when we were in lockdown who lost over a hundred pounds from just walking. So she committed to diet and she walked a hundred pounds off. So you can do it with walking, uh, but a combination I think is probably ideal for most women. Walking, when, you're do, when you are incorporating walking, you really wanna do long walks, like 60 to 70 minutes. And that's when you really start to get uh, like more time in that fat burning zone. And then you can balance that out with a few sessions a week a week of some sort of, you know, weight-based exercise, um, but it doesn't have to be intensive. You know, you can do, you know, 20, 25 minutes. And if you don't have an hour at a time, can you split it up? Maybe take a half hour walk after dinner, maybe a half hour walk in the morning or on the weekend you have more time, but during the week you do a little yeah. less? Right, absolutely. So, I mean, in terms of longevity and overall health, the time component is 150 minutes a week of cardio. You can do that however you like. If you're trying to use walking to lose weight, like, and you don't have time during the week, do your half hours. And then on the weekend, do like a two 90 minute walks. And that's really going to get you some better results. Yeah. And, you know, it's nice. You can maybe listen to a Kara's Cures podcast while you're walking. You can make it enjoyable. I know a lot of moms were looking for some me time and, uh, you know, going out on a walk. Uh, 
rather than a treadmill. I find it's actually like a nice little thing that it's good for your mental health, which that's kind of where um, in our time today I want to end. The mental health is really important too because if you're stressed out all the time, and like you said, as parents, we're juggling kids' schedules, bills, all this stuff, um, you really advocate that people develop some sort of a stress reduction routine, whether that be more sleep, which is really important, or taking up mindfulness, some deep breathing, something to reduce the stress. Right, for sure. And just like you said, walking could be a form of that where you're going out for a walk outside and you can listen to podcasts, you can look, listen to, you know, audio books, music, whatever it is that does it for you. And then incorporating sometimes, you know, throughout the week that you're doing things that you really enjoy, right? And it doesn't have to be a lot. It just, you know, you just need to have that in your life. And that makes a big difference. Of course, meditation is a great practice to incorporate. Um, you know, 10 minutes once or twice a day can make a big difference for all those stress hormones that can be surging. <laughs> yeah, okay. So really, I mean, so much of it, which we've always been taught, calories in, calories out, um, it's, it's not... Uh, really the truth. I mean, when it comes to our hormones, there's a lot of chemistry going on. And when we fix things, um, you can lose a lot of weight. Yeah, for sure. Yep. It's not a lost cause. That's what I always tell women because they come in and they're like, oh my God, I'm not, I haven't changed anything. And I'm like gaining 10, 15 pounds with doing nothing. Um, and it's, it is, it's a product of hormonal changes, but there are things you can do about it. I want one more question for you. Um, what about intermittent fasting? And I ask this because I know it's the panacea on the internet. Everyone's saying fast, fast, fast. I myself have had trouble with it. I've always been one of those people who feel like I get really hungry and maybe a little hypoglycemic. So it always seems like a struggle for me. Or should we push through intermittent fasting or is it not good for everyone? Yeah, I would say it's not good for everyone. So it's not a panacea for everyone. I've had patients who've gotten good results with it, but I've had definitely my fair share of patients who've done really poorly with it. Symptoms, you know, just like you were describing, or I've even had patients who their glucose levels have actually started to go up on it, which is like the reverse of what you would expect to happen. So some women are coming in and we're taking them off of it. If someone is trying intermittent fasting, the research shows that it's probably better to have your cutoff time in the evening versus like eating late where you're skipping breakfast. You probably should really be eating like close to when you get up in the morning, at least before 9 a.m. in the morning. And then, you know, having a lighter meal earlier in the day. So you're having that kind of break through the night and in the evening instead of in the morning. Okay. All right, some good advice. And uh, just, you know, shout out your website in case people, um, I know you do Zoom appointments as well. So if you happen to be far away, um, uh, you can, that's a great thing. You guys can order tests from anywhere, right? <laughs> right, absolutely. So our uh, clinic website is wholehealthllc.com. And then I have another website, um, drstag, drstag.com. And you can find more information in there about like books and um, media, all sorts of media that I do. Yeah, yeah. The bitter prescription for losing weight. And I know you have another one called Unzip Your Genes, which is all about our DNA, yeah. right? <laughs> so yeah, if I do a DNA test, sure. can you tell me what I need to eat and which exercise is best? Will it reveal that to you? Yeah, so with DNA testing, you'll find out not exactly what to eat, but what when we were talking about macros, like whether you should be on like really a low fat diet or more of a balanced fat diet, more higher fat, it does tell you more about your macros. And it does tell you about exercise as well, whether you should be more cardio or more um, weight, you know, resistance training. Okay. Fascinating. Fascinating. All right. Thank you so much for the great information and hopefully we can all put it to use. We appreciate your time, Dr. Stagg. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. And if you want more information on the cutting edge of wellness, you can watch other Karis Cures on WFSB Plus or listen. And please like and subscribe. Share it with your friends, the Karis Cures podcast. I also share it on social media. You can find me there at Kara Sundlin. Have a great day and be well.